Welcome to chapter 5. And in this chapter, we're getting into distribution. Now, traditionally in marketing texts that are based predominantly on physical goods, distribution is down the back end of semester. It's one of the near to last things that is discussed. In services, it's one of the priority parts of the marketing mix. And one of the aspects that really sets services apart from goods and goods dominated uh, marketing is that in services, you often need to bring the customer to the service as your distribution channel, rather than bringing the product to the customer. So we think about uh, the classic goods model of distribution. The idea is to get a physical object from point of manufacture to point of sale to in use by a customer. In services, because we have co-production as a major factor, you need to ensure that the point of production and the customer are located in the same point in time and or space. So co-production changes the priority for distribution. It's now about ensuring the customer gets to us at the point that is useful for us both as producers and them as customers. So let's look at what distribution does in services. And here we start thinking about the idea that distribution looks at the notion of information flow. Because services are intangible, because services are high-end credence attributes, you need to be able to move ideas quite often as much as you need to be able to move goods, services, products, and what you're trying to do with the service distribution channel is bring together the customer and the behaviors you want the customer to undertake. So you're looking at in distribution, moving ideas, moving promotion, moving the skills, teaching customers how to engage. You're also perhaps moving the negotiation. For example, if you're going to a service production such as uh, a concert, football, Disneyland, you buy the rights to use the service. So you buy the tickets to access independently and quite often well in advance of actually going to the service itself. So you are distributing the point of purchase and distributing the point of production. And the product flow, which we've alluded to a couple of times, that this is about moving people to the service process or the service process to people or people to items. There's also this other aspect where services can be processed whilst moving. And in this case, we're usually thinking about transport, public transport, trains, planes as private transport. And then we start getting into the concepts of airline service, uh, cab rides. So the service is a moving landscape. So again, distribution is more complicated in services because the production is happening whilst the customer is present in the service. And depending on what the service is doing, now, if we take something like express delivery, so you're looking at Australia Post or DHL, you are processing an item at a negotiation point. So there's a front end where someone comes to the service to drop off the package. You are processing a service whilst moving. You are ensuring the safety of the goods that you are taking on the responsibility for moving from point A to point B. And then you are bringing together a people to service or service process to recipient. You have to deliver those goods, so there needs to be an end customer. And that end customer is actually the client, quite often the client. So a customer who pays has one point of contact. The object that they're paying to move has another distribution service flow. And the customer, the client who's going to be on the receiving end of the product has a third different distribution point. Kind of complicated. So one of the things that when we talk about the flower of service, and you'll notice that a couple of times, is that we have the physical processes and the information processes laid out inside the service flower. 
For example, on the physical process side, we have safekeeping and hospitality, artifacts and people. So when people are within the service and the service distribution is underway, we have the physical processes that are looking after the service flow, and it's a distribution channel issue. Particularly if your uh, hospitality safekeeping combination is you are transporting people from one point to another. On the information service flow, your distribution channel is looking at ensuring that the artifacts that support, so the back end of a service blueprint, which we'll talk about in a moment, the information processes like the order taking or the information or the payment and billing have their own distribution requirements. The information as to what was ordered and how much it costs needs to move and quite often needs to move some degree of distance to ensure through multiple parties to ensure that when you buy something you actually you, know, you buy the ticket from a broker say we're talking air travel hotels using whatif.com or you're going to a travel agent an order taking process takes place a billing process takes place we need to ensure that that payment and that information flows through the channel so that the service is delivered successfully so that when the customer shows up at the hotel, everything's been handled. So in terms of our distribution options, we've got a couple of things in play here. And that is basically this, you can think of it as a continuum of the customer goes to the service organization, the service organization comes to the customer, or, and if we think of it as a triangle, the customer and the service organization transact remotely. So here we're looking at from the point of view of customer goes to the service, theater, customer comes to the service, house painting. You're not going to take your house, you're not going to just drop your house off at the painters and pick it up again later. So is there a point where the product or the service has to go to a customer? Is there a point where the customer comes to the service? Both of those make decisions for you in terms of the type of service scape, the type of physical environment, the emphasis on physical objects in your service uh, marketing mix, and your distribution channel issues of, are we planning for people? Are we planning to be in a location that has traffic access? Or are we planning for something else? So, Lastly in this, in terms of things like the remote transaction, this is a lot of the e-marketing, but it's also factors, you'll note on here, it's the telephone, it's the TV. TV is a service. There's no Game of Thrones that you physically hold. Probably quite good. I suspect it would be a little bit squishy and sticky by now. There's no TV broadcast that produces a physical artifact. So it's a service, it's a live, real-time, co-produced service. So it's done through multiple sites and it's done remotely. Again, this gives us a whole series of decisions and choices to make. Part of that as well, when, uh, one of the things that we will be increasingly aware of is the self-service technology. Now, in effect, these videos and the Wattle site are self-service technologies. But so is the book. When you read a textbook, it's a self-service technology. When you read any form of book, because it's an embedded service, you are unlocking the elements. And this is why it's really interesting to look at things like self-service technology in light of the co-creation of value, the Vargo and Lush idea of the embedded service, and Start thinking about well, what is the what are the characteristics that are important here? The perceived usefulness, the ease of use, a perception of risk, and to what level do you feel that you still retain control in the encounter where there's a technology involved? Now you might also, if you've studied consumer behavior, recognize that the SST determinants, the characteristics, are very close to the innovation adoption framework. So it's really important to be mindful that whilst the technologies exist, you're still dealing with a similar sort of market need for usefulness. 
Uh, it's one of the things that, uh, if we look at the service flower, the lack of usefulness of a lot of the automated processes. Yes, it was efficient. Yes, it was better for the company in terms of management, but the customer didn't see a usefulness to a self-service technology. So the self-service technologies were removed or tailored back. At one point in the late 1990s, it was generally believed that you would not talk to a person on the phone ever again at a helpline or a help desk. They would all be able to be done by pressing buttons on keypads. Down to the point you could actually uh, create quite complicated uh, queues of messages and if-then options, which were taking longer for the customer to work their way through than it was for the customer to speak to someone directly. Because the time you were ringing up a phone line was you needed the customization, not the automation. All right, let's talk a couple of distribution elements. Top of the, the charts here, physicality. Again, I'm going to push you back to the textbook to look at this and the different options here, because this is a case of thinking, what's the most useful option for the service that I want to provide? Do I need a shop front? Do I need a premise? Am I producing a service that is equipment dependent? For example, if you go to a dentist, the dentist's environment is equipment dependent. They have complicated machinery, but they also have the requirements of the sanitation, the cleanliness, so that they need to have a very controlled environment, which whilst it's a personally delivered skill and the skill comes from the expertise of the dentist, the physical environment is a critical part of the distribution. Similarly, if we look at something like the size and scale of Disneyland, the service location, the place and distribution is integral to the product. It's part of the product. Your other options you have on services, you see things like the mini stores, you visit uh, some of the major shopping centers and they've got the little pop-up bank kiosks they've got, and they've got around tax time, your temporary accountant. So you can set up a mini store. You can also have shared purpose facilities. Uh, one of the things you'll notice if you go near a gym where personal trainers are operating, that there are a range of options that the personal trainers can use in that gym to create a service that's co-located with similar services. Of course, you also got locational constraints. You can't offer skiing in somewhere that doesn't have ski slopes, so you can't offer ski instructing where there is no skiing to be had. Our virtual reality systems aren't that good. The other question you've got to ask yourself is the concept of when. Now, with the 24-7 coverage of the internet, humans still sleep, people go home, and there's still a dominance of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. as the working day, rather than a rotation, a lot more shift rotation. Whilst we're seeing more 24-7 coverage in stores, firms, and other locations, it's still really hard to find a dentist at three in the morning. Don't bother trying to find a hairdresser after about seven or eight, and I haven't seen a lawyer advertising that they will be there waiting for you to come by at two in the morning. So you've still got temporal constraints. One facet of the temporal constraint is that it does actually create, if you're using a brick and mortar environment, it creates a downtime. And this is where things like the 24 hour access gyms combine self-service and venue access. So uh, fitness first or uh, Anytime Fitness has a brick and mortar location, but they are able to transform that into a self-service technology by using 24-7 swipe access and adding on a staffed service period. So there's a range of options that you've got here to try and explore alternatives, try and create additional products out of your uh, capacity, particularly your underused capacity, outside of operating hours. All right, again, a pushback to the text. I want to mention a couple of things here. 
The intermediary, the internet was supposed to take intermediaries out of commission. It just made intermediaries much more effective. So what happens in the split responsibility is that the original firm will create a service. There will be an enhancement, an add-on by the distributor of the service. But you as the customer only experience it as a single combined entity. And this is where some of the challenges come in for, when we look at things like uh, service quality and service scape is to what extent do you as either the distributor or the originator have control over the other petals of the service flower? How do you ensure that the core product you're offering is being supported by the supplemental services? So keep this in mind is that when we're talking about services, we are talking about this multifaceted, not just delivered by the creator. So we're talking about you know, possibilities of franchises, we're also talking about a bunch of the international and internationalization strategies, which uh, appear in the Intro to Marketing course and they appear in the uh, Global Business courses here. So again, if you've done the USN 3024, you'll be familiar with this. Otherwise, it's a pushback to the text. Go have a look at these. Also, internationalized strategies, if you're looking at this from the point of view of strategic decisions to do with services, you can also think about it in terms of, well, how would I apply some of this thinking to moving my service internally, regionally? So don't assume, don't, oh, uh, how should I say, don't discard internationalization strategies if you don't plan on going overseas. Look at them in terms of, this is where I can see a distinct change in behaviors of target audiences by regional areas. What are my considerations? All right, let's get down to one of the really interesting models. And this is the, the Showstack Service Blueprint. Now, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to talk you through the service blueprinting process and how the pieces work. It's one, again, that I think is worthwhile for you to you know, obviously I'm going to push the text, but to also then do your own service blueprint. Even if it's not for points, even if it's not for the money, do it for yourself to get a sense for how services operate and how you can make use of the blueprinting principle in your own life. So what your basic premise here is, is that you can map points of interaction. You can generate a flowchart and diagram that talks about the touch points, the points of interaction between customer and service. What become the points then of critical support? And what's the back end that needs to be here? So let's look at a blank diagram for a second here. We have, and I'm actually borrowing from the Zethamol text, the postgraduate text here, to give you this bit of content. And the next three slides are marked as coming from this particular framework. In the blueprint, you have the front line, the first line, which is the physical evidence. When this interaction between customer and service takes place, what are the physical elements that are present? And by physical evidence, we also include internet, mobile technology. So if we're mapping this subject, one piece of physical evidence is this video. A second piece of physical evidence is the Wattle site or the YouTube channel. So we note those pieces of evidence. We look here then at what does the customer do in the, what are the customer's actions at this point? So you'd be watching the video, that's what we'd note down. Where is the line of interaction? Yeah, uh, am I on stage and visible? Technically, but are you interacting with me? Probably not. So the line of visibility then also talks about how much of the backstage can you see? Now you don't get to see the production suite. You don't get to see me filming this video. You don't get to see the background. So the back end, the coding, the writing, the slide development is invisible. What are the support processes that need to be here? Well, I need access to obviously the recording resources, 
I need access to a working website, I need a functional web server, things that you are not going to care about as a student because what you want to know is, is this week's slide up? Can I watch it? Yes, it's working. Excellent, I'll take my notes and I can go and get ready for class. So the invisible stuff you don't care about, but if the website's not working or YouTube's not streaming or your internet's down, suddenly those backstage invisible elements become very critical and very visible. So the other thing about Service Blueprint is that you need to make note of how points of failure would become visible or invisible, remain invisible to a customer. So there is a sequence. So what you want to do in the blueprinting process is work out which parts of the process. Now you should understand the service blueprint is not a one-off, one-time event. You can do blueprints for subparts of the process. You can do a holistic one for the whole engagement of the service, or you can go down to step by step. Okay, somebody wants to order from us over the phone. Let's do the phone calls. We'll do a different blueprint for sending a text. We'll do a different blueprint for using the phone application, a different blueprint for the website application. So you've got to identify your process. You then want to look at your customer. So you could do multiple blueprints, one for each customer segment. And this is why segmentation is so important in services. You then want to map this from the customer's point of view. And this is where you're going to use market research techniques like secret shoppers or observational research. Your third step, once you've mapped, what's the customer see? Where does the customer interact? Step four is to look at where is the contact with the employee? How does the firm, how does the service interact with the customer? So we've got the customer's interactions. What do we do then as employees? Or what's the technology doing? Step five then is to go and say, what do we need to have behind the scenes to make this work? What has to be underpinning this whole operation? And the last level is, what evidence will be present to let the customer know that the service is taking place and that the service is working? So a demonstration example of this is, the point of contact here is that the customer places a phone call. So there's no physical evidence. It's a call to a customer service line, so it's an invisible contact. That has a back-end process of dispatching in this case, it's a uh, express mail delivery. So the back end process triggers a driver to go over to pick up the product, pick up the package. That driver is then the first physical, visible representation of the firm. So elements we'll talk about later, such as integrated marketing communication, and service scape. This person is the embodiment of the brand and the embodiment of the service. So you can see that there's a lot of physical evidence here. There is a customer driver interaction, then there's a driver interaction where the driver goes back into the back end of the process. And you'll see that there's a complicated set of back end processes that are required, all of which resolves with a different driver delivers the package and becomes the embodiment of the brand again. So if we look at this from the point of view of where do we need to use other elements of the marketing mix? And that's the other element to the service blueprint. So we're bringing it to your attention now and early so that as we move through other elements of the marketing mix, you can start seeing how when you're blueprinting, you'd want to make note of, ah, oh, okay, is price going to have an impact here? Is promotion going to be useful here in the blueprint? How does the IMC work in terms of physical evidence? Where's the people in the process? What are and this is also in the seven extended P's mix of services marketing mix. This is process. It's also that part in the AMA definition of activity and processes. So that's a wrap for the chapter. You follow through. Think about how service blueprint would fit inside the cinema experience.
So that's your, uh, your case. And so for this round, I think, well, what's the service blueprint required to set up people going to the movies? What, what's the theory and framework that underpins here of using the cinema, going to the cinema, attending movies? How does that compare? How does that change by audience type? And does it change by ticket structure? Does it change by gold class versus standard tickets? Does it change by cinema venue? Think about the blueprinting in this context and how it works. As always, if you need me, there's my contact points. If you've got any questions, let me know. And the other thing with the service blueprint is that this now gives you an opportunity as a services student to look at a service environment and go, how much of this is intentionally front stage? How much of this is staged in terms of we can see the backstage, therefore that backstage is intentionally visible? If it is visible, what is it doing in terms of altering perceptions of the service product, the service quality, or perhaps modifying the attributes for, uh, of credence, experience, and search? So be conscious and mindful of the service blueprint as you're engaging in services now. What is intentionally front stage? What is supposed to be hidden? And what is brought to the front stage? And then for what reason is that there?